Um, uh, the other issue is, the, is that if you, if you make that kind of gift, when you give your house to your kids, if you give your kids any asset that is a, an asset that is appreciated in value over time, like a house or stocks, but typically this comes up in the house. Um, as you folks all know, uh, if you were to sell your homes tomorrow, uh, you would be in, in your, you're living in them, you're entitled to a, uh, a capital gains exemption. Uh, equal to $250,000 if you're single and $500,000 uh, if, if you're married. Uh, and that exemption reduces the amount of tax that you might have to pay regarding the sale of your house. So, in, in, so for a lot of us you know, who bought our homes many years ago for, remember, like $50,000 was like a lot to pay for a house, right? And, and now it's worth three or $400,000. In the absence of that exemption, you'd be paying a capital gains tax on the gain, which is the difference between the sale price and the purchase price. So in Mary's case, if she had bought her house for, for $50,000 and was selling it for $300,000, her capital gain would be $250,000. If she sold that house herself, she'd pay no tax because she has a capital gain exclusion of $250,000. If she keeps the house until she dies, then at the time of death, that tax basis, the $50,000 number, jumps, it steps up, and we talked about this last month. The basis goes up to the date of death value. So if she has left the house to her kids and her kids then sell the house, their basis is $300,000. So if they sell it for $300,000, they pay no capital gain. If though, Mary has given the house to her kids, she gave them her basis at the time she gave them the house. That is the $50,000 which means if they turn around and sell the house the next day or even after Mary dies, they will pay a tax on the difference between $50,000 and whatever it is that they sell it for. Now the total capital gains tax right now, it's a flat rate, it's around 20%. So it's 20% of $250,000 would be about $50,000. So by just giving the house to the kids, she may have cost, cost herself a lot of money. She could also, and some of you may have heard of this, she could also give the house to the kids, but if she's really worried about that control issue, she could keep something called a life estate in the house. A life estate is basically total control of the house as long as you're alive, including the ability to sell that interest, to sell your life estate piece of the house, as long as the person who owns the rest of the house is also willing to sell it. So she could give her house to the kids but keep a life estate and therefore keep control of it while she's alive. Um, that also, and by doing it that way, by the way, she also preserves the fact that if she then dies, there'll be a step up in the tax basis so that her kids, when they go to sell it, will not have to pay a capital gains tax. The only thing that you, that you don't avoid by doing this is, this step up, is, the, is the, uh, the, uh, the problem if you have to sell the house while you're alive. If Mary gave the house to the kids but kept a life estate, and then during her lifetime, she and the kids decided, well, this house is really getting too big. You know, I think I really want to sell it. Well, in that situation, there would be a capital gain that would be owed on a piece of that sale. So that's one of the possibilities. You can just give property away. You can give anything away. Uh, and you can kind of wait the five years, and then you're safe. A second possibility is that you can put the property into trust. And this is where everybody always says, so what's the difference between a revocable and an irrevocable trust? And typically the difference is, this is the time you want an irrevocable trust. Pretty much in all other times, you want a revocable trust. If you, if you create a trust, naming one of your children or somebody else as the, some trusted person as the trustee, and transfer that house to the trustee, and keep a life estate in the house, 
Uh, but tell the trustee, and these are the terms of the trust, that, that when your life estate expires, when you die, and therefore when the trustee becomes the sole owner of the house, the trustee is going to give the house to, or divide up the proceeds, you know, give it, do the, whatever, whatever you say that they're supposed to happen to the proceeds, that's what the trustee is going to do. But in the meantime, you tell that trustee, if the trust is earning any income, then you want the income. You want to be entitled to the income. Well, in this situation, the trust isn't going to earn any income because the only thing that the trust is holding is the house. But you kept the life estate in the house, which means the trustee doesn't have the ability to charge anybody any income. So as a practical matter, there's no income. But by transferring the house to this irrevocable trust in which you're entitled to the income, for tax purposes, you kept the house. I know that sounds a little bizarre, but as long, that's one of, the, one of the income tax rules. So if you, if you transferred property into trust, but you kept either the right to the income from all the assets, or in the case of a house, the life estate, then for tax purposes, the house is still yours. And so, in terms of eliminating the disadvantages that go from the direct gifts, right? You've taken care of the lack of control issue because you're still in control of the house. You're still living in the house. You've taken care of the stepped up basis issue because you kept a life estate. And you've even allowed yourself to assure yourself that if you and the child of yours who is the trustee decides during your lifetime that you need to sell the house, there's not going to be any capital gains as a result of the sale of that house the reason why you hear a lot of people talking about irrevocable trust as kind of the way to deal with these issues. Next slide. So, what can Frank and Mary do ahead of time? So, you know, suppose, that, and I assume that there are some Franks and Marys in this room, so kind of what can you do ahead of time? Well, um, you can try to deal with this house issue right now, right, by transferring the property into an irrevocable trust. You may want to do something similar regarding IRAs and other assets of yours that are individual assets in terms of making sure that upon your death they don't necessarily go directly to your spouse. This relates to one other kind of general planning tool. Probably the most common planning tool among couples um, who are trying to deal with these issues uh, is actually to not transfer assets out into an irrevocable trust, but to basically change both of their wills. And the reason why they want to do that, and, and to change both of their wills so that if one of them dies, instead of all the assets going to the other one, the assets probably go in trust for the benefit of the other one, with the remainder after the other one has died going to the kids. The reason why you, te you tend to structure things that way, I talk, this is a piece of the world that I do a lot of, and so I talk to a lot of folks that are, that are dealing with these issues, and often, they will tell me, they'd say, but I would never, you know, I would never allow my spouse to go into the nursing home. And I'll say, I totally respect that. Unless, of course, you're dead, in which case, you know, there may be a problem. And they'll say, well, oh yeah, well, of course, that, that could be a real problem. Because then there may not be anybody there to kind of take care of her or to take care of him. So, as I mentioned earlier, if you are both alive, and, and one of you goes to a nursing home, all of your assets can be safe. The only issue happens if one of you dies. So one of the most common ways of dealing with that issue is to have both people change their wills to specify that in the event that that person dies, all of the assets owned by that person are going to be held in trust for the, for the, for the other one. There, that relates to what is the one kind of general exception to the five-year rule. The five-year rule says if you give things away, there's this look-back period of five years. Death is the exception. I mean, it's a, it's a tough, tough way to get to the exception, you know. But it, but it is an exception. So if you die and as a result of your death, assets go to some third party, that, the assets are safe the next day. So in Frank and Mary's case, if Frank had owned all of the assets, if Frank had owned the house and had owned all of the cash, and had specified in his will that upon his death, all of those assets, instead of going directly to Mary, were going to go in trust for Mary's benefit, or that some of them were just going to go in trust for Mary's benefit, all of those assets would have been safe the next day. And if the next day Mary needed nursing home care, she could have gotten it. 
Same thing on the other side. If the assets had been in Mary's name, and Mary had said in her will, upon my death, I leave everything in trust for the benefit of Frank, uh, or to my kids, but, but most often in trust for the benefit of Frank, and Mary then dies, then, the next day all the assets are safe. I mean, we had this situation happen Actually, at the beginning of last year, someone came in, it was, a, it was one daughter, uh, it, was the only, it was the only child, who came in just distraught because the mother had cancer um, and she knew she was dying. And the father had early stage Alzheimer's. And they looked a lot like Frank and Mary, you know, they owned a house and they had some cash and they had some stuff. Uh, and so she was just saying, you know, this is just, you know, my mother's about to die and the nursing home is going to get everything. And we said, no, um, what you can do is, we're just gonna shift everything, and, and the mother knew, and the mother was really distraught because she, had, always, she was, had been taking care of Frank. You know, she had been taking care of the husband. He was kind of like slipping. So what we did was we, just, we, 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 we had the mother change her will to specify that everything was going in trust for Frank's benefit. We transferred everything to the mother. We transferred the house and all of the assets to the mother. The mother died three weeks later. Um, and the, the father ended up in the nursing home where he still is and immediately qualified for mass health. And all of the assets will be safe and will eventually go to the daughter. So the mo one of the most common techniques uh, is to basically, is to, if you want to keep control of, is, is to keep control of your assets, if you want to keep control of the assets. And then, of course, the, this leads to the kind of the final question when you're trying to figure this out. So, who gets the assets, right? Does, do, you, do you put all the assets in Frank's name or do you put all of them in Mary's name? And I guess there are a couple of answers to that. One, um, well, you could always split them, but then of course, if you're splitting them, that just means you're protecting like half of the assets. If one person dies, you're protecting that half in the event the other one goes to a nursing home. A second possibility, a lot of times there'll be one spouse that's significantly older than the other. And you just say, take a guess. Put it all in the name of the older spouse. Um, or if there is one spouse that you think may have more, because of family or whatever, more of a tendency to be heading towards, towards Alzheimer's, in that case, you put the assets in the name of the other spouse. But the main thing to do, uh, and the kind of the most common thing, what I try to emphasize to folks, is, is you know, as I tell people, everybody dies. Just about nobody drops dead. Some people do but very few people just drop dead. If both of your wills are set up so that if, one of, if that person dies, all the assets are safe for the benefit of the other one, then whoever has the assets, as long as each one has a power of attorney from the other, and therefore the ability to deal with these assets, we always have the ability, if one person gets sick, or if one person has a stroke, or if one person looks like they may not be doing well, at that point to shift the assets. At that point to shift the assets. We've literally had the situation where we've shifted assets this way two or three days after or before somebody dies. And, and once again, what that gave the family was the ability to keep control of their assets while at the same time trying to protect each other. So um, that's the kind of the most likely candidate. Next slide. Um, in, in brief summary, by the way, this is always the goal. The goal of all estate planning, the, the goal of all asset protection planning is to sleep well at night. So I'm, I'm kind of suggesting these things to you. Um, I'm telling you that if you want to be transferring assets into an irrevocable trust, you pay a price for that, right? You're losing some control over those assets. Uh, if you are setting things up in any of these ways, you're, you're paying some kind of, a, if you're shifting all the assets to the husband, and the husband finds a very special woman in Miami Beach, you know, and takes all the assets, well then, you know, you've got a problem. So each, each one of you needs to kind of weigh out for yourselves kind of how you want to structure things. I'm just kind of suggesting to you some ways that, that, that you might want to consider doing it. Thank you very much. Any questions regarding any